as promised, I wanted to share my near-death experience with you. And I could spend a lot of time on this. Um, but I thought I would just go over it generally and then maybe come back and talk about parts of it later because um, it was an experience that I can, I mean, I still think about every day, um, trying to understand it or finding new stuff that I didn't um, understand till now. So there's a lot there. But I wanted to go with a step-by-step -step, um, part of it to kind of just tell uh, what it was, a general overview of it. I uh, had a heart attack on August 21st, the day of the eclipse in 2017, and uh, it was on a Monday. I had a triple bypass on that Friday, and then Sunday, when they took the tubes out, my heart stopped. And it took them about 35 minutes to get my heart going again. And uh, uh, they shocked me because I was in VTAC, ventricular um, fibrillation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and that is a deadly rhythm. So they're trying to get me out of that rhythm back into normal rhythm. So they had to repeatedly shock me, which I was awake for. Um, well, probably not all of them, but after I came back to my body, I was awake for at least three, if not four of them before it just knocked me out. Um, it was like being in a real life horror movie and it was quite the welcome back to earth. So anyway, who, um, my heart stopped and I was gone for 35 minutes. My heart also stopped after my um, bypass surgery, uh, but he was able to, my friend who's an ER doc, um, he, uh, I call him little brother, was able to get my heart um, started again. So had a couple of them, but the second one was definitely longer. And, uh, and then after they, you know, got me out of the VTAC and got me stabilized. It got me back up into my cardiac ICU room and my heart stopped again. And at that point they were able to get it started again. And they put me, um, in a drug induced coma and I was on a heart lung machine for five days before I regained consciousness. So during my death experience, which happened in amongst there somewhere, um, I, I really think it was in that 35 minutes because I remember coming back to my body. But the first thing I experienced, I don't remember crossing over um, really or anything. I think that that memory is probably there, but I have not regained it. Um, I lost my memory of the whole time I was in the hospital when I came out of my coma and actually I the rest of like the whole year or more before that was a little bit sketchy but it it started coming back to me but the time I was hospitalized before my surgery or my coma is just gone forever so I I don't I've been told that doesn't have any bearing on my near-death experience because that is like related to my physical body and not my consciousness or my spiritual self but I just, um, I have bits and pieces come back to me. So maybe I'll get that. But for right now, all I, first thing I remember is I was in, um, darkness and I had been there before, um, years ago, I had gotten stung by a wasp and went into anaphylactic shock and coded. And I went to this dark place then. So anyway, I'm back in the dark place or you can call it a tunnel or whatever you will and uh, then I um, am now out in space and I'm floating in space like I said before and uh, I'm looking at all the stars and everything and um, for just a second and I'll never forget it but for a second I felt all alone in space and it was so big it was so big and I felt like 
I was all alone there and it was a little bit scary to be honest. And, uh, then, um, I felt all these spirits and they were in celebration that I was home and I was thrilled to be with them again. I've known them for millennia before this earth. And I knew that I would be there with them forever. Um, that I had left them and gone to this earth and um, now I was back. And they were thrilled to see me and I was uh, thrilled to be with them. It was the strongest sense of home that I've ever felt. I've never felt that on this earth. And uh, this is where I belonged. This is where I came from. This is where I will belong and what I'm a part of. And, uh, and I was back and it was joyous. And as I'm looking into space, it, I can see galaxies and nebula and it was beautiful and colorful. It was just amazing. And I remember asking, what about Mike? And, uh, I was told that Mike would be okay. You know, I was worried about what he was going to do without me. Hey, kitty, kitty. And uh, I said, you know, he's, what's he going to do without, you know, his wife? And I was told that he will be fine. And, you know, that that would have been part of his life. And it, it, would, it would all be all right. And so I didn't have to really care about Earth anymore. In fact, shrugged it right off. You know, I was home. Um... The next thing I know, I'm in a big hall and uh, there's these giant white pillars to the right of me. And uh, Mia, and um, in front of me were like relatives who had gone before because I knew them all. And they were standing there um, a, a bit far off and uh, they were just you know, smiles on their face, glad to see me, radiating love for me. And I was thrilled to see them and be with them. They didn't approach me. They didn't touch me. They just all stood there. And uh, one of them did come up to me. I believe it was my sister, Angie, who had passed in 2005. And uh, I don't know if we embraced or not, but I was relieved to see her. <laughs> Cause it was a little bit scary, you know, I mean, it wasn't a, anything bad about the place, but it is so real there. It's more real than we ever feel on this earth. And so it was a little bit intimidating. Um, but yet I felt complete peace and, and happiness, but it was really a big thing. And, uh, so she was there to comfort me and make me feel better. And, uh, I remember I was being told, I, I don't know, she told me that uh, I wasn't going to be able to stay, that I had to go back. And uh, I remember saying, no, no, I can't go back to that life because this life prior to my experience had been very hard. And I had spent my whole life rising above it and overcoming it and being optimistic and trying and being resilient and and uh but yet there was this giant well of pain and sadness and anger and rage and um hopelessness and just all this dark stuff sad stuff and uh i was free of it there and I said, I don't want to go back to that. I can't do it anymore. I can't, uh, I've got nothing left to, left to draw from. I, uh, I, I can't go back. I'm not going to go back. And they were all very, um, assuring me that I could do it. And they had ultimate faith in me and you can do it. And it was just, just so uplifting and, um, just so sure that I could do this. And then, uh, but that I was going to have to go back. And I then protested again and I said, well, 
I'm not dealing with him anymore. And by him, I was referring to the adversary, to Satan. Um, he has done everything in his power to get me to follow after him. I think having this well of anger, sadness, pain, rage, everything, um, gave him something to work with. And he really worked hard on me. And so not only was I being resilient by keeping going, but at the same time, I was in this mortal battle with him daily. I mean, it, it was fighting him sometimes minute by minute. It was hard. And, uh, at one point he almost won. Um, he almost told me to destroy myself, but Emily father, we're going to let that happen. So I made it through that, but, uh, and I, I might talk about that later because there's a lot to be learned from that situation. But anyway, so I was like, I'm not dealing with him. I can't, I can't fight him anymore. I don't want to deal with him anymore. I'm, you know, I'm over it. And, uh, that's when, uh, the savior who's to my left and I didn't see his face. Um, but he pulled me into him and he says, you're mine now. And he pulled me right into him. And without looking at his face, I knew who he was. Completely knew who he was. And I was in his embrace. The one thing I've always wanted, more than anything, anything on this earth, I wanted to be in his embrace. And here I was in it. And, uh, Poured all this unbelievable love into me and uh, I knew who he was it's like I commingled with him in a way I knew him I knew I was his and I was so happy but I still had to go back to earth and I must have agreed. So the next thing I remember is I am traveling back to earth. And uh, as I'm traveling back, I see this little blue dot way, way away. It's just a tiny dot. And as I'm coming back to earth, uh, I've got a guide or maybe it was a savior. I don't know who it was with me, but I got to ask questions. I think it was him. And I got to ask all the big questions, you know, the questions you have your whole life. And um, one of the things that always has been heavy on my heart is uh, all those who suffer throughout the world, little children starving, living in the streets in South America. No parents, just living like street dogs. And uh, and people living obscure little lives and full of pain and anguish and the wars and the contention throughout the earth and all of it. Just, I asked him why, why, you know, what about them, you know, Syrians, you know. And uh, he said, this is their life's journey. That whatever they're going through is what their spirits needed to come to earth for. And that it's only for a nanosecond in the time of eternity. So it lasts for just a second. And then it's over. And that will be the story of them. And, and that's what they will have learned through this experience, this earthly experience. And the other part that was so important to me was that 
no one lives in obscurity. That every single person on this planet right this minute or whoever has lived on this planet is adored and cherished and perfect in his eyes and loved immeasurably. No one is forgotten. Even though they may feel that way and their lives may be that way on this earth, they are choice, beautiful people to him. And that gave me so much comfort. And with regards to wars and the fighting and all that, he says, you can't hear it, can you? And he was right. I couldn't hear it there. And it was all of that stuff is limited to that, that planet, Earth. You can't hear it from space. It all just is on that Earth. And it, it doesn't go beyond there. It stays there. I guess when this Earth is over, it, it will be gone too. But it was limited to that planet. And uh, that made me have a lot of peace. The other question I asked, I looked down and I saw the leadership of my church. And I said, well, what about those guys? Is that they got it right? And I was told verbatim <laughs> that they were going about doing the Lord's work on earth. Exactly, quote, unquote. And that gave me a lot of joy because I love them very much. And uh, they have taught me and led me and uh, to know that they were his and they were officiating on his behalf made me feel wonderful about it. As I'm getting closer and closer and earth is getting bigger and bigger in my view, I was told by what I would say as a host of heaven because it wasn't just my guide now. It was like angels or heaven's host told me to tell people about the love. And the love is immeasurable. It, uh, it's beyond human comprehension. It uh, is like floodgates opening. And it's this golden beautiful sunlight that just permeates every part of your soul and it's absolute and it's complete and it's very individualized and very specific for each person and nobody's left out and uh, also that love is the universal language or maybe it's what binds the universe together but that that is the governing law of the universe was love. And it was just everywhere. It was like I was swimming in it. And after my, um, you know, recovery, I started swimming and it just reminded me so much of being immersed in love. And so I really, really enjoy swimming <laughs> and it's, you know, good for my health as well. And just before I'm back in my body, they said, there are no judgments. That we are all just little kids, basically, in this experience. You know, we're learning to find our way, and we're going through this, and we're growing up. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter what age, um, that we're all learning and growing. You know, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We're, we're celestial beings, you know, having an earthly experience. And that is true. And uh, they said, you wouldn't get mad at a toddler if they fell as they were learning to walk. You know, and I was like, no, you know, and that's just the way they feel about us. That how could they get mad at us, you know, as we're learning how to do this and that we are adored and cherished so much and that the last thing was is that we're never alone that they're here that they help us not here but they are mindful of us and they are watching us and they're helping us out as they can and uh, that we're just never alone we we have the host of heaven that is helping us and pulling for us and doing what they can to help us and uh, 
that was the last thing um, that I really remember. And then I remember going back into my body. I felt like I slid in from my left side, kind of slid into my body. And uh, I remember coming to or coming back to life. And I remember for a few seconds there, there was the dual realities of the vastness of everything. And then the box. And I remember kind of freaking out a little bit having these two right next to each other. That was a little too much for my mind to handle. And so I mentally focused on earth and this life. And the other went away. Um, and I uh, remember seeing these billowing pink like curtains and uh, and then I heard she's back and then a woman was not happy with um, something and they said we're gonna have to shock her again and so they did and it was like being hit by a truck going 60 miles an hour my teeth actually rattled in my head my eyeballs, I swear, hit the back of my eyelids. It was horrible. And uh, I guess I, you know, uh, I don't know if I screamed or whatever. And this woman was not happy still. And she said, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to, you know, do it again. And uh, I just remember hearing her and she had a, Germanic kind of voice and uh, she was in charge obviously and uh, so they they cardioverted me again hit me with the shock again and uh, I had the same literally it was like I'm being hit by a baseball bat right in your face and uh, whoa and uh, I'm now fully like on board here and uh, she still was not happy and they there was some talk but i don't see anybody i really don't i see in front of me but then i'm you know you know and then you see stars and and uh so she was like oh we're gonna have to do it again and i screamed out i'm like no 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 i was like you're hurting me you're hurting me and she gets in my face and she's the only one i can see and she says mrs sales we're trying to save your life and uh, in that moment, I decided to trust her. And they hit me again. And then I, I must have lost consciousness because I don't remember after that. The next thing I remember is waking up. Good. That was on Sunday. I was waking up Friday. And there's my mom sitting there. <laughs> and I got to say a little bit about that. My mom was out in Utah. She flew out because she was told that if I wasn't going to make it through that night, Sunday night, that I may not make it. And it was a little touch and go there for a little while. And uh, she needed to be there. And so she came out. 